What are you laughing at? <laughs> you. <laughs> hey, welcome to another episode of the Equip Pat. Dang it, the <laughs> Equip Podcast. That was a great one too. <laughs> hey, welcome to another episode of the Equip Podcast. I'm Steve. This is Pastor, aka Dad. Can I call you Dad? Is that fine? Sure. Cool. Sounds great. Yeah, no dad, problem. Yeah, this is my dad. And uh, you've been in this series for the last. You just ended it, right? Three weeks right. called Forge Ahead, and yeah. that's kind of been your vision for 2022. You want to just sort of walk us back for those that maybe aren't a part of our church or for those who are part of our church and don't know the story, like where'd this come from, where the heart of it for the year, the whole concept of Forging Ahead, where's that, where'd that start? Well, really it started probably with COVID, and, uh, and I just started seeing how the church needed to be the church, the church needed to... Forge ahead. Mm -hmm. And so I was using it a lot. Yeah, uh, it was one of those things you just said. Yeah, I just said it. That happens uh, to you a lot where you just sort of verbally process and you have a right. word that sticks in your heart. Uh -huh. And we start going, hey, like that seems like that's really important to you. Yeah, so last July, last August, I just, uh, God really just told me he wanted the vision for 2022 for the church to be Forge Ahead. So I introduced it in October and Especially, I love it when God allows me to be excited about this new vision. I, sure. I love that. So what does that mean to you? To me, it like, means that in so many different ways just to forge ahead. I mean, and even in the series, we've been talking so much about how, like our culture, we're in a different culture. And I believe that uh, many churches are being paralyzed by the culture. Many pastors are being paralyzed. They're, they're second guessing themselves. Sure. Okay, what direction should I take? Because all of a sudden, all these different cultural things are being thrown at us as a people. And, and so, was that sort um, of the trigger for you? Was like you you seeing a lot of pastors who you didn't feel like maybe were pushing through some of the boundaries and walls that culture was creating? Was that sort of the heart behind it initially? Or is it the church at large? Uh, the church at large. I I didn't like the fact that um, there were so many churches that uh, remained shut down. I understood uh, maybe for a month, two months, whatever. But um, but yeah, I finally you know when once the churches were able to emerge out of uh, being shut down. Um, that we just needed to forge ahead because I'm very strong with what the scripture says that we need to assemble ourselves together on a weekly basis. And that means together, physically together. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I thought would be cool, because you've been going through this series for, I think, three weeks now, and this has been a subject you've been talking about for probably coming up on a year at this point. Mm -hmm. But I thought it'd be cool to just sort of take some of like the leftovers of like things that maybe you've you know, like, you know how it is when you're writing a sermon and you have something that's in your heart on Monday, but by the time you get to like Saturday and you're about to actually deliver it, right. the Lord's either totally tweaked it or you, there's not time in the, in the, in the gathering time to really hone in on the point the way you wanted it to. So I thought it'd be cool to just sort of take this, this subject, this concept, and just flesh out a few of the ideas that maybe you didn't get to like fully expand on as you've been preaching on it and give people a little bit of taste. So is there anything specific, any stories or any points that like you felt like resonated with you that you didn't get to like flesh out the way you wanted to preaching? Uh, yes and no. Uh, one of the things that really, really stood out to me that maybe I wish I would have uh, been able to spend more time on in the sermon is where I was talking on Daniel and um, how even in Daniel's day, how the culture... Uh, how I talked about in that sermon, how Satan has always tried to change God's culture. There was one culture and only one culture. It was in the Garden of Eden that God created. It was his principles, his standards. And he said, here, you can enjoy my culture in so many words, enjoy my world. Just don't uh, touch from that center tree. And so with God's culture, I, I, would, I like using the word culture that God has set up for us ever since the beginning of uh, time. Satan has always tried to come in and distort 
the principles of God, the standards of God, the foundation, the culture of God. And so uh, I wish I could have spent more time on Daniel and on those words. Um, I love it here in Daniel uh, chapter 6, verse 10. And when, you know, all those men try to come against Daniel and say, or uh, to try to change the governmental rules uh, and said, hey, king, um, anyone else that bows their knee to any other god but you will be thrown into the lion's den. And the lion's den uh, was always used before the thing with Daniel. It was always used as a, as a uh, fear mechanism. Mm-hmm. You know, we always have these fear Hip-hop. mechanisms in every government, in every nation, and I don't care what uh, culture they try to uh, push on us. There's always this um, fear. Pastors, uh, this isn't just for pastors, but if a pastor's listening, pastors have this um, thing in the many times in their church where people, with their words, they try sure. to, uh, you know, infuse fear. I had, a fear of man. Yeah. I had one person come up to me and they literally, this was years ago, they literally gave me their, uh, try to give me their tithe statement and, and basically said, if you don't do it this way, this is how much money you're going to lose. And I said, put your tithe statement away. You can leave the church right now. Was it a lot? Was uh, it actually yeah. scary? Oh, yeah. As a pastor, was it a uh, moment I didn't where it was look scary? at the tie statement. Oh, you, smart. But eventually I found out what it was. And, um, yeah, it was a lot of money. But I never have let uh, money control what God wants for his church. And uh, and I remember you can. I said, you can leave the church right now. Um, this is God's church, and we're going to go God's way. And so there's always that um, fear mechanisms out there that try to infuse. And the same thing was happening with Daniel. We all know the story that uh, basically Daniel knew, the Bible says that Daniel knew about the new law. But I, this is the part that I love. But just as he, uh, it, it says it in uh, verse 10, that Daniel went and he prayed he went to uh, upstairs in his room. The windows were wide open like normal. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So this was his regular routine. This was his regular routine. I think that's sort of your point, is that yeah. he like he didn't let the culture press on him to change his regular routine. Right. Like This is what he had established with the Lord. What I thought was really interesting when I was reading this earlier is if you look at verse three, it says, now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps, he had exceptional, by his exceptional qualities, that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. I thought it was really interesting that it says like he distinguished himself. And then it says after that, it goes on, they could find no corruption in him. He was trustworthy. He wasn't corrupt or negligent. It starts describing his integrity. And what's so interesting is these are all things that come from his life of prayer, his his success was the was the way was that was the Lord ordaining his success because right. he was devoted to the Lord. His integrity came from his life of being in the secret place, you know, being being in quiet time with the Lord and really pursuing the Lord privately. All of his success came from that. But like, what hit me when I when I read that was what so often happens is we pursue, it's almost like we'll pursue the Lord to the point that we find the success. It's like, it's like I was re- I've been reading about David and you see that it's like, he is this quiet man of humility until the point of success, at which point he kind of abandons the way he had gotten to that mm-hmm. place in the first place. And what was interesting as I was reading this is like the things that made Daniel distinguished to actually be the leader that he was, he, he was quick to make sure he didn't lose that. And I think so many people, especially leaders, it's so quick to be like, they do the things, the disciplines that are necessary for the rise. And then once they've risen, it's easy to abandon all of the disciplines that actually got you there in the first place. Mm-hmm. But you can't maintain where you were unless you do what you had always done to get there. Right. I think that's what you're talking about with Daniel is he he got to that place through prayer and he maintained that place through prayer. Mm-hmm. And like the king, 
the people around him, they all recognize it. And that's why some were trying to kill him because of it. And, you know, and the king, mm -hmm. Darius, is trying, ultimately, he wants to protect him. For those who don't don't know the story, like, you know, he's thrown in the, in the lion's den. The king doesn't want to do it, but he's sort of trapped by his own words. And this is ultimately what, what the culture is, that, that culture of that time is thrusting upon him, is trying to get him to change. And I think that's a great point, is he just kept doing what he had always done, in your words, forged ahead. He kept just coming back to, like, the consistency of who he had always been and how he got into that place in the first place. Well, and, and, and where the forge ahead mentality has come with me, where, again, you know, Daniel, Daniel never questioned his God. He never sat back and said, God, maybe the culture is changing. Should I change? Do you think internally he was tempted to do that, though? But see, that's the that's the whole point I'm trying to get to. Uh, today, I, I don't believe he was tempted with that. And again, he could have been, but I, I don't believe because the scripture never indicates that he just went into his upper room, windows open, and he literally did what he did before. And uh, today, there is so much temptation to, oh, the, the political culture. Look at the political mm -hmm. culture changing. You know, look at, look at the, um, um, all these different cultural moves that are happening in our schools that our kids are being taught, uh, our public school system, uh, you know, people that are talking to us in our churches and our friends and, I mean, Everybody is literally quick from social media to everywhere we go are quick to change with the culture. We're finally a Christ follower. And there's a difference between a Christ follower and just a so-called Christian because we follow Christ. Christ made a culture that he was not going to be he himself was not going to move from what he was here to do. He even looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You're not going to get me off track. And, um, and so uh, we should not be tempted. A true Christ follower, as we follow Christ, we should never be tempted. Uh, sure, people are tempted. I was say, and it's you, okay to be tempted. You think there's grace for that? Yeah, it's okay to be tempted. Um, but it, it shouldn't move us. But we have to have the resolve to and that's where we, stand firm. Yeah, and in this, multiple cultures that are being thrown at us, we have to forge ahead. Mm -hmm. And that's where literally uh, the concept of forge ahead, that everything in you, if you're gonna, um, if you're gonna have relatives that are gonna turn their back on you, if you're going to, which Jesus says they will, uh, if you're going to have friends, uh, if you're a senior pastor or a staff pastor, you're going to have maybe people leave your church because you're forging ahead in God's culture and you're not, you will not bend a knee to man's culture. Sure. It, it takes everything in you to forge ahead. And so that's where the whole concept came that God was just really uh, stirring in my heart. And you know, I, I, I got that uh, I got that over in the sermon uh, when I preached it a couple of weeks ago. But that's probably one point I wish I could have maybe stayed on a little bit longer. Those words that Daniel said, or the in uh, verse ten, he basically he didn't um, uh, he didn't skip a beat. He didn't deviate. He didn't deviate. He did what he did before. And I think. Culture, it, I think that's a good word for it. I think that's an interesting word as I think about it. Because if you go back to even like what God seems to be doing, I think it's interesting that you even started it in the garden. That he was de trying to develop a culture, right? He was trying to develop uh, cultural systems of family, cultural systems of, of, of even hierarchy, cultural systems of, of uh, the purpose that we're to go outside the garden and to make the, everything outside the garden subdue to the culture in the garden, right? Well, and then That's real all... quick, look at the culture that he built for the mm -hmm. children of Israel right out of Egypt. And that's my point, is that he that seems to be God's plan throughout. Right. And that's probably why the, you know, the antithesis of it, what Satan is always trying to do, is to attack 
through the culture. Actually, a really great book on this is The Daniel Dilemma. If you've never read it by Pastor Chris Hodges, he, he really breaks this down how the Babylonian culture, their whole goal was to break the children of Israel that they brought right. into slavery and submission by forcing them to, them to submit to the Babylonian culture. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, even Jesus's language all throughout the New Testament, if you sort of go back mentally, like he really speaks about culture. Like even when he teaches them to pray, it's your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like the apostles are constantly reminding them that we're not citizens of earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. Like that when Jesus comes back, he's going to come and establish his throne as a king mm-hmm. with with us, you know, ruling alongside him and governing a culture that like ultimately the the beginning it's just an interesting thought that like the beginning and the end game is all a culture totally submitted to the will and the ways of of heaven and so as you're talking about forge ahead and like how the culture presses on that mm-hmm. and how ultimately what what we mean by that when we say the culture's pressing on that is we mean that there are people who don't believe the same things that that you do that we do that the church does whatever it is people who don't believe the word to its core <clears throat> begin to press with their own opinions and beliefs and all of that. It that's what becomes difficult is other people's opinions. It's the fear of man, it's the it's the fear of your reputation, whatever it is. And so one of the most important ways to like maintain culture is the people that you keep around you. That you have right. a you know that David had his mighty men that he knew he could depend on, that he knew were men of integrity that because mm-hmm. he knew he couldn't depend on Saul because Saul was showing at that point that he was of a different culture than what David was feeling called to. How have you found that important and what are the ways that you have like fought throughout your life, your ministry, your marriage, your family, whatever it is, to maintain a culture of people around you that like want what you want, that want what the Lord wants as well in the same vein, in the same spirit. Yeah, as a, uh, as a pastor, it's very important to have the right people around you, but uh, greater than that, as just a Christ follower, yeah. we have to have the right people around us. Um, I... I want. I wish I would have spent a little bit more time when I did this sermon on Gideon. Um, that was again uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, when I did the sermon on Gideon on Forge Ahead in the Forge Ahead series, uh, it, it was really important because he finally had enough faith. And get this, he finally had enough faith to trust God with thirty-two thousand men. Okay. But God saw something that he didn't see. And 32,000 was already expecting to get their heinies whooped because that was a pretty small number in comparison. It was a small number to come against 135,000. The enemy was 135,000 strong. But it was um, possible with 32,000 when you think about it. It wasn't crazy considering other war stories. Yeah, it wasn't crazy. But when he finally submitted to God and he said, God, I have faith in you. To lead the way. That's the key. Get self out of the way. Lead the way. And then God saw something that Gideon didn't see. He saw that 22,000 men were literally fearful. They had a spirit of fear because the Bible indicates that fear is a demonic spirit. That that should not be in our lives. And so, but we're all tempted with fear. I mean... Uh, we're all tempted with that fear that wants to literally take us over. And, but God saw something in 22,000 men that were, they were shaking in their boots. And so finally, uh, um, you know, God takes out the 22,000, leaves them with 10,000. And then again, God sees 97,000 men that shouldn't be with Gideon, that did not have Gideon's back. They might not have been men that were um, shaken in fear, but they were probably men that were selfish. They were about themselves. They weren't of the same spirit. They weren't of the same spirit to really have Gideon's back. As a Christ follower, I want to have fellowship with people that have my back. Mm -hmm. I want to have fellowship with people that I have their back. I want to have fellowship with people that we're in a... We're in a um, trench. You're you're literally fighting. You have each other's back. You have you're literally back to back with a gun, and you're you're watching every angle where the enemy's trying to come against you. In these days, we need people to surround us like this. And this is the this is the thing. The way it has looked in my life for years, 
years as following Christ. When I haven't seen it, God has taken people out of my inner circle of influence in my life. God has literally taken out people. Uh, it, it literally has happened every year uh, as I have walked with God. And I thank the Lord for it because God did it with Gideon. God took out people that could have influenced the battle because when they finally went to battle, and we all know the story, they went to, he finally went to battle with 300 men. Uh, if he would have gone to battle with those men that were so fearful that they were shaking in their boots, that same attitude would have rubbed off on other men mm -hmm. and they would have became fearful. You know, it's sort of like we are who we hang with type Expound of thing. on that point because I thought that was, that was probably the most interesting thing to me in that mm -hmm. message was that point right there where you sort of said, you know, imagine you're on the battlefield and you've got this resolve and like you've decided, you know, because I, I can only imagine what it takes mentally to go to war. Right. What it takes the night before. Like laying in bed, just deciding, like becoming resolved in your spirit that like I will go out. I will give my life if necessary. I will do whatever is necessary to make sure that the people I'm fighting for are protected, right? So you go out with that resolve, and then the guy next to you. Yeah, you want the guy next to you to be saying, when he starts seeing you shrinking back, you want him to say, no, no, Forge, forge ahead. ahead. Yeah. Forge, you can do it. You can do it. You're a mighty warrior. But if instead he dips, if and he, he turns around back. and he runs... You're what does that too? do to you? And that's sure. a, that was a really interesting point when yeah. I was here when I heard the message. That was probably the thing that stuck with me the most from it was was the importance of surrounding yourself with people. We always we always tend to take that from the perspective of like you know one bad apple spoils the bunch, and it's like well if you're hanging around with people of bad moral character, then you're going to develop bad moral character. True, which is which is a true point, but sure. that tends to be sort of the extent that we really teach it from. That fear is actually something that becomes a cultural norm. That when you're in a group of people who are all afraid, even if you weren't afraid of this thing, suddenly you find yourself terrified of something that was never a boogeyman to you because you've surrounded yourself, you've been entrenched in a culture of fear. And I thought that was a really interesting point that whatever resolve I come into in the battle, it's still my responsibility to stay and fight even if everyone's running around me. That's still the responsibility of the believer. Right. But Paul says in, Gal in uh, Galatians 6, 2, I think, he says, bear one another's burdens and in this way fulfill the law of Christ. That the law of Christ is actually fulfilled in me helping you with whatever you're struggling with. That, like we're bearing that together, right. that we're walking through that together. And that it's my responsibility to fight the battle no matter what, but it becomes increasingly more difficult to the point that it becomes nigh impossible for some people to do what they've actually been called to when they're surrounding themselves with people who only run. Right who only get out of the way of danger instead of uh, Matthew Henry in his commentary, uh, he says, it is prudent to go out of the way of danger so long as it does not take you out of the way of duty. And that mm -hmm. quote has always stuck with me. It's okay to get out of the way of danger. It doesn't mean you don't have to stand in front of a train and call yourself a, a Christ follower. We don't have to subject ourselves unnecessarily to pain, but we cannot get out of the way of danger if in doing so we also get out of the way of duty. And I think a lot of people abandon the danger, not accounting for the fact that the danger was their duty. And when we do that and we begin running from our duty just because it's dangerous or it's scary or we don't know how we looked at in the culture, like when we do that, how do we affect other people around us? That, right. that really messed with me. Well, and the Apostle Paul, when, he, when he's talking about the soon coming of Jesus Christ, he basically at the end there, he says, and encourage each other with these words. Mm -hmm. So you will stand and continue to stand. And uh, I don't, I, I have men around me all the time that all of a sudden I might, I might just get really be in a real discouraging mood, man. They will encourage That's me. Good. You keep preaching the word, you stay alert. And then there'll be times that they're really discouraged and man, I will speak truth into their lives that is what, that is the church of Jesus Christ actively at work forging ahead. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, with Gideon, I mean, Gideon, then the beautiful thing with Gideon is he submitted. You never read every time God or, yeah, God said, 
okay, you got too many men. I'm taking 22,000 out. He never argued with God. And he was afraid. Like, it's really clear he was afraid, but he trusted the Lord. Yeah. He, he yeah, chose to press yeah. through the fear. And, and I think he, that's important. Yeah. And he forged ahead yeah. through each moment. But the Bible never said that he argued with God, that he complained. It was more in the beginning of all of that when he finally said, you know, he put all those fleeces out in, um, I think it's chapter six. He put all these fleeces out before God. And the angel of the Lord kept proving, kept showing up, kept showing mm-hmm. up. Finally, when he submitted Mm -hmm. everything and said, God, I'm yours. I will be a mighty warrior. I am a mighty warrior. And whatever direction you want to take me, I submit to your will. And that's the key. When we see things going on around us that don't make sense, like Gideon did, it didn't make sense go from 32,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 300. Nothing made sense. But he stayed the course. He forged ahead, mm-hmm. and God allowed him to win the battle. And what's interesting is when he ultimately, like, did like fully submitted himself, mm-hmm. was actually the plate. That was the moment when the Lord brought him to the scariest place. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times we think that when we finally submit ourselves, the Lord will give us back the hundred thousand. You know, what I mean, He'll bring us back to the greatest sure. place. And in all reality, what He's looking to do is get full submission from our own spirits and our own Mm -hmm. hearts so that he can take us to the scariest version for us. Right. So that when it works out, we will not... And that was his point with Gideon. And that was his point with the children of Israel. He wanted to make sure that they couldn't take credit for it. Right. He does never, ever wants us to boast. Boasting is such a evil part of man. Uh, He wants us to boast always in the Lord. And that's really where the bottom line that he was getting with Gideon, that he was not only bringing men around him that would bring a victory Mm -hmm. for him, but they would only boast in God at the end of the battle. And, um, And then the awesome thing is, when he was so much in God's will, and he was following after God, Only with 300 men. And I'm sure he had to think like every human man would think. I don't know how this is going to work Mm -hmm. out, but I'm going with God. And they charge the enemy and the 135,000. Think about this. They pulled their swords out. They got so confused, they turned on each other. Right. And they killed each other. And so really, the 300 really didn't have to do much of a, a battle. Right. And I think the battle was the obedience. Yeah, I the think battle that's what's interesting. Right, the battle was the obedience and the submission that Gideon did, but first it had to be the faith. Mm-hmm. Faith, when applied properly, and when literally we go forward in faith with our Lord Jesus Christ, He confuses the enemy mm-hmm. every time. Because see, the enemy knows that he has such a strong weapon, especially in these days. Fear, confusion, um, insecurity, depression, um, this culture, that's all these different cultures that are swirling around us. He has, he has, you know, he uses these things. So he doesn't really expect us to be faithful. Mm -hmm. And when those few are faithful, even when it doesn't make sense, it confuses the enemy. That's good. And so it will confuse the enemy in your life and marriage when the enemy comes against you in your life as an individual, when you're looking for a healing that a doctor says one thing and the enemy wants you to be fearful and submit to what that doctor says, but you need to walk in faith and say, no, my God heals. Mm -hmm. And when we go forward, I believe with all my heart, you'll confuse the enemy and God's healing will come to an individual. It's good. And I think the important takeaway for me from that and from that message and this whole thought is, is the responsibility that I have to, to cultivate a culture of bravery and not even bravery, dependence, reliance, submission to the Lord that like I cultivate a culture around me that doesn't allow fear to become a norm in my life or in the people around me. And what's interesting, what, what comes to mind for me is when Paul says, you referenced it earlier, he says to Timothy, that spirit is not a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound right. mind. That fear is a spirit. But what I always 
go back to in that verse, the verse, right? that's the one we all know, but the one right before it, Paul says to Timothy, he says, fan into flame yeah. the gift of God given you through the laying on of my hands. Because mm-hmm. that spirit is not a spirit of fear, but of power of love. And he makes this point to fan into flame, it is your responsibility, Timothy, to stir up, to fan into flame the spark, to fan it into flame what God gave you when I laid my hands. That yeah. Timothy had around him a Paul that would encourage him, lay his hands on him. And then it became Timothy's responsibility to stir it up, to not allow right. fear to become a norm in his life. Because if you do that, the Lord produces all of these other things. And I think that's ultimately what you're talking about, is we got to be people that are producing a culture that is not afraid of the culture that the enemy is producing Amen. and that we're, we're facilitating it through the, the, the army that the Lord's surrounding us in. So yeah. do you want do you have just a final encouragement or do you just want to just pray either one? If you want to just encourage the people and, and just pray over them as they go out throughout their day. Yeah. I think we just need to pray. I love to pray over them. Dear Lord, right now, father, there's these that are listening Dear Lord, that maybe they're pastors, uh, Christ followers, God, so they're good people of faith that really are trying their best to forge ahead. Lord, let them not fall in temptation, but Lord, let them be your foundation. Let them stay with your culture. Let them be brave enough. God, it's not so much what we say, but it's what we do. Uh, Daniel, all he did was pray. And as he prayed, he was strengthened to be thrown into the lion's den, and you protected him. And dear Lord, Gideon, all he did was finally submit and obey to your will, God. And then, Lord, you did the rest, and the the battle was won. So, Lord, help us in this culture. Help us as Christ followers, and help these, dear Lord, that as they put their faith forward, as they put their obedience and their submission forward before God, And dear Lord, just like Jesus said, Lord, I will do your will and your will will be done. Dear Lord, that we will have that kind of thinking, dear Jesus. And Lord, I so I pray that over churches. I pray that over pastors. I pray that over Christ followers, that they will forge ahead. And Lord, victories will be won. Healings will happen. And dear Lord, people, will come unto you in salvation. We thank you for it. In your precious name, amen. Amen. Amen.